All right, so today's pre-lecture, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the idea of center of mass. So we should learn in class about the center of mass. Um, the center of mass is a thing that we can use for a collection of, uh, of particles, so it might be, you know, many particles, but they're, they're interacting, and so they're moving as a whole. Or it could be an object that has its mass extended over a large volume or area, like a donut or a sphere or anything that would be irregularly shaped. So it could be either way. We start off with the definition of thinking of it as many individual particles, but they are interacting and working together. So um, either way, the center of mass is the location where the total mass could be considered to be concentrated. That allows us to simplify the mathematics and the physics a lot because we don't have to track all the individual particles and look at their motion individually. What we can do is we can look at the, the system as a whole. The same thing would go for, um, for something like a, a distributed mass, like a sphere or even an irregularly shaped object. We can almost pretend that it's a point mass located at the center of mass. If we're talking about the um, collection of objects, we would have this definition that the position of the center of mass is going to be located at um, what we would really call a weighted average. And the average, the position is being weighted by the mass. So we take the mass times the position for each object. We divide through by the mass. And so this can be written as the summation notation. And that, um, that quotient would give us the position of the center of mass. Um, you know, if we wanted to um, talk about it in terms of x and y coordinates, of course, the x center of mass would be the summation of the x coordinate times the mass divided by the total masses. And the y center of mass as well would be the weighted average, but weighted by the y coordinate. Now, what if I have an object that's mass is distributed over a large area? I might take a little piece of it, dm, and I'm talking about the position of this little piece. What we can then do is, instead of talking about a discrete piece of mass, we'll substitute this with a dm, so it would be x times dm, but the dm indicates we're going to integrate. So, and then to total up all the little pieces of mass, again, we're going to integrate. So when we're talking about uh, the center of mass for a distributed object, the summation changes to an integral. Don't worry, we're not going to really do any examples of this. You're not going to have to do these calculations. It's just good to know. So, like I said, the reason that we like to talk about the center of mass is because an object will move as if it's, all its mass is located in position. Here are two classic pictures that would show that. Objects that absolutely aren't like point masses, they're not even a ball. We have a hammer and we have a snowboarder. But notice they're both flying through the air. And for the, for the hammer, you can actually see the path traced out of the center of mass. And notice it's a parabolic path, like we would accept, expect for a projectile. And I think it's pretty easy to see, even if we don't know exactly where the center of mass of the snowboarder is located, you can see the arc of his path. And imagine that if we located his center of mass, we would see that the shape of this path would also be a parabolic path. So if we are looking and talking more about the motion of the center of mass, one of the things that we can do is we can um, sort of take the velocity of the center of mass. Now what they did here is, remember, if we have the position of the center of mass would be the summation of the individual positions over the total mass sub m sub i. If we took the derivative of that, 
which would be the velocity of the center of mass, it should look like oh, instead of weighting the masses by the position, we're going to weight the masses by the velocity. And the sum of the mass at the bottom, that's just the total mass. So we might designate that by a capital M. And so you can see where we got this expression up here that the, um, the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass is equal to the sum of these individual, oh, look at that, it looks like momenta. And so we're actually looking at here and we see that um, using this idea of the center of mass, then we also can rearrange the velocity of the center of mass, and we see an expression that looks like the total momentum of the system. Now, if we remember, in last, at the beginning of the chapter, we rewrote Newton's second law to say that the sum of the forces was equal to the rate, time rate change of momentum. Well, what if we have if the sum of the forces is equal to zero, then that means that the momentum is equal to a constant. And from this expression, it would also mean that the velocity of the center of the mass is constant. And this is a piece of information that we can use to help us solve problems. A classic type of problem for this would be um, this problem here with the canoe. Now let's just think about this. Someone's in a canoe, and somehow this girl has the dexterity to be able to walk in the canoe and not fall over. But she's going to walk from one end of the canoe to the other. Now what do you think is going to happen as she walks forward? I think it's fairly... Um, reasonable to expect that as she walks one way, the canoe is going to walk the other way. You know, it just is going from action reaction. As she's walking forward, she's going to be pushing the um, canoe back. That's one way to think of it. Another way to think of it is if we have no external forces, and we're going to assume that the canoe is able to move very easily in the water, which of course is not quite accurate, but it's one of those perfect approximations that we're going to use, so that the velocity of the center of mass is constant. But if we assume that when she started walking, the canoe was motionless, so in this case, the velocity of the center of mass is actually equal to zero, which means that the position of the center of mass remains constant. And we're going to use that to help us find the solution to, if she moves a certain distance to the right, how far will the canoe move to the left? And so here's a problem from the back of our book. So we have the 45-kilogram woman who's in a 60 kilogram canoe that's five meters long. She's going to start right here, one meter from the edge, and she's going to go to this location one meter from the other end of the canoe. I'm going to set up my coordinate system so that x equals zero is right at the edge of the canoe, and I'm going to find out where the x center of mass is for the system to begin with. I have the 45 kilogram woman, and she's at one meter, and then the 60 kilogram canoe, well, the center of mass of the canoe can be located at the exact center because it's a very symmetric object, so that's 2.5 meters. And then I divide by the sum of the masses. If I do the calculation, the center of mass is 1.86 meters. So that's where the center of mass of the system is. Now, what we're going to use is the fact that that center of mass position is going to be constant. It's not going to change. Now, I know that this is my x equals 0. I know that if she moves forward, the canoe is going to move backward a little. So an accurate picture here would be to now have the canoe look something like this where this might be the unknown distance that the canoe has moved. I'm going to call it x. 
And this is where the person ends up. Remember that this is one meter away from the edge of the canoe, the far end of the canoe. So what is her new center of mass? I have to try to figure out how I would write the position of both the girl and of the canoe and how I would use it to calculate the new center of mass position. Well, the new um, center of mass position of the woman, well now we know that the distance from here to here is four meters because the canoe is five meters long and she's gone almost all the way to the edge but she's just one meter away from this far end. So I want to know her position right here. That was going to be four minus x. So that's four minus x. Similarly, the position for the center of mass of the canoe, so from here to here, is 2.5 meters. And so the position of the canoe center of mass, now I could write as 2.5 minus x. So this is the new way that I could solve or calculate the center of mass. I know that this has to add up or calculate out to be 1.86 meters. So then I can do the calculation. Get 1.86 times 105 is equal to um, 45 times 4, which is 180 minus 45x plus 60 times 2.5 is 150 minus 60x. Um, I'm going to bring all my x's over on the other side because that's going to be more convenient. So I'm going to get 105x is equal to, and if I do all my math out, it ends up to be 135. So my x ends up to be 1.29. So the distance that the canoe has moved is actually uh, 1.29 meters. So it's kind of a neat way that we can use this idea to help us solve the problem. So the last thing that we look at is, okay, well, what if there are external forces, um, and how does that affect? So the idea is that what we're going to find is that if you have a body, a distributed mass, or a collection of particles, and they're acted on by external forces, what happens is the center of mass is going to move as, all, as though all the mass were concentrated at that center of mass point and were acted on by the net force. So we kind of start off with this, the velocity of the center of mass, of course, times the big mass is the total momentum of the system. We found that F is equal to P dt, which is going to be the derivative with respect to time of, oh, sorry, of M times VCM, which equals M, because that's not changing. And we just find that the total forces, and I should have written that as the total sum of forces, is going to be equal to the mass times acceleration of the center of mass. So so the idea being, if I take all the forces, all the forces added, This will tell us how the center of mass is going to accelerate. Here's an interesting picture kind of showing this effect, where what if I have a, a bomb or a cannon who begins flying through the air, but then at some place in its path it explodes, and for simplicity's sake it just split into two different pieces. The two pieces might go very separate ways and take different paths, but notice that the center of mass continues with the parabolic path, the reason being is that the force is the force of gravity, is acting on this whole system, and so the motion of the center of mass will be to move as if it's under the influence of gravity, which will give us the projectile path.